Welcome everybody to this micro lecture on law and morality. As you can see, our today's micro lecture is structured in the following way. We'll first try to find out uh, what is the common ground of different concepts that you can see here, law, justice, values, morality, ethics and religion. Of course, we then have to shed some light on terminology and we'll then look at the relationship of EU law and morality. And our three guiding questions, they are precisely on those uh, three issues. If we look at law on the one side, ethics and morality on the other side, also religion and the values that uh, you can see between law uh, and ethics or morality, which can be seen as a, a bridge between those two uh, disciplines. If we look into those values of the European Union, you can see that justice is one of the values of the European Union. And again, the question, what do all those different disciplines, uh, different concepts, what do they have in common? Well, in the end, it's the question, uh, what's the right thing to do? So as you can see, uh, the, the subtitle of this book of Michael Sandel, on, on justice. So in the end, all those disciplines, all those concepts try to tell us what is the right uh, thing to do. So that's the underlying uh, common ground, if, if you like. As you can see on, on this slide, um, there are several topics where not only within Europe or the EU, but on a worldwide scale, we can see that there is a change in the attitude of society. And if we go back to the concept of democracy, of course, the attitude of the people living in a country, in a state, should be reflected in the laws, ideally. That's the essence of democracy, so that the attitudes of the majority of the citizens of one country is reflected in the legal provisions. But of course, if the legal provisions are not changed, if the attitudes of society change, of course, that can uh, then lead to the question, should also the law be changed either by parliament or by courts, as uh, we have seen it in this other micro lecture. So there are some topics where we can observe those trend of changing attitudes of, uh, of, of the public. Uh, same-sex relationships, both partnerships and marriage, uh, abortion or also cannabis. So those are some of those uh, examples which, all, which can also be seen here uh, in this overview from The Economist. Now, why do I mention this change of attitudes? Um, very often the two notions of ethics and morality are used interchangeably, but we should separate them because it's two different uh, concepts, as you can see. Ethics is uh, a branch of philosophy, so of practical philosophy. And as you know, there is another micro lecture on ethics. So if we now focus on morality, uh, looking at this definition from a very famous uh, book on bioethics, I quote, morality refers to norms about right and wrong human conduct that are so widely shared that they form a stable social compact. As a social institution, Morality encompasses many standards of conduct, including moral principles, rules, ideas, rights, and virtues. We learn about morality as we grow up. So that already implies that morality uh, can change, uh, as we've seen it on, the, on the previous slide. And uh, if we look on the next slide at on the a way how the European Court of Justice deals with the concept of mor uh, morality in its case law. On the bottom of this slide, you have one example, which is about, uh, which is from the field of gambling, and gambling is seen as a very sensitive field. Uh, and the statement of the court in this field of gambling, but we can find this statement also in other fields, uh, refers to. Uh, significant moral, religious and cultural differences in the member states. And if there is no harmonization, so no EU law determining the rules in the member states, then it is uh, for each member state to determine uh, in those sensitive fields in accordance with its own scale of values 
what they deem to be uh, uh, okay. So as you can see on, on top of this slide, what we can take from this quotation of this co uh, court case is that morality has a uh, regional or territorial component. So morality is clearly different in different member states. If you look, if you go back to the example of abortion, there are more liberal countries in Europe, there are more conservative countries, so that changes from country to country, uh, maybe sometimes even within the country in different regions. Second, it also has a clear temporal component. So, as I mentioned earlier, for a lot of topics we can see how the attitude has changed over the course of time. So there are various examples, uh, surpassing the, the three examples from the previous slide. And as it's mentioned uh, by the court here, uh, morality is based on different values. So that's the third element that we can take from this court case. If we uh, go back to the functions of law that you have seen uh, in this other micro lecture, uh, I just want to highlight one function. So besides giving order, besides maintaining power, but at the same time also controlling power. So the one function that uh, I want to highlight now in this micro lecture on law and morality is the function uh, of fairness. So law as a function of morality and also a social function. So I think that's very important to keep in mind. So even though I've mentioned that law maybe is not changed, but the attitudes of morality changes, still law should uh, have this function of morality. Now, what can you find uh, in EU law with regards to morality? So as you can see from this overview, very often morality is used like an umbrella, so kind of to protect the member states of the European Union from interference of uh, EU law in this field. So the essence is member states do not want to be forced to change their attitude in some sensitive fields. And as you can see um, here, uh, the first example was uh, Ireland, uh, which has been a very conservative country, especially with regard to abortion. And so after a court case where in 1991, where the Irish feared that they might be forced by the EU to be more liberal, they uh, wanted to have a safeguard, so an umbrella, so to say, which should protect them from interference uh, of the European Court of Justice in the field of abortion. So that's where in this protocol to the Maastricht Treaty, 1992, uh, it was stated that nothing in the EU treaties shall affect Irish constitutional rules on abortion. If we go on in history, you can see that Malta, also uh, a conservative country in that regard, had the same fears and they also uh, uh, asked for a clause or a protocol, which is EU primary law, that nothing in the EU treaties, again, shall affect national law concerning abortion. Now, with regard to Poland, as, we, as you can also see, there are two examples, a declaration to the accession treaty of Poland to the EU and a declaration with regard to the Lisbon Treaty, where we can see that the wording is a little bit different and it goes into the same direction, that nothing in EU treaties shall affect questions of moral significance. So the wording is broader, reference not only to abortion but to morality. But of course, uh, as it can cl be clearly seen, the intention was again that uh, Polish attitude should not be changed by e the EU. And uh, quite similarly, uh, a declaration to the Lisbon Treaty. Now, all those examples, again, are approaches of an umbrella trying to protect member states from EU interference. On a more broad, broader scale, uh, if we look at the single European market, at the free movement of goods, or as you can see on the top of the slide, we have the free movement of goods as a principle, and we have possibilities for exceptions. So we call them reasons of justification. And as you can see there in Article uh, 36, public morality is such a reason of justification which can justify restrictions or barriers to the free movement of goods. Now there's a very famous uh, case in that regard to show you what uh, that means. It's a, a British case uh, and it was about uh, the confiscation by the UK customs authorities 
of certain goods which have been imported from another member state. And uh, as it's uh, mentioned here in this uh, famous judgment, during those inspections at the airport, uh, the customs uh, officers realized that there were some goods, inflatable dolls, uh, which they considered to be, I quote, indecent uh, or obscene articles, and therefore they wanted to prohibit the import of those products to the United Kingdom. So the question that had to be addressed in that regard is, is it possible for a member state to prohibit the import of goods coming from another member state? As first sight, we would say no, because that's a barrier to the free movement of goods. But as we have seen, public morality can be an exception to that principle. And therefore, the question is, who should define uh, what is indecent or obscene? Or if we link it to this reason of justification, should that fall within the concept of public morality? And who should define public mor morality? the UK authorities or the European Union? Well, and of course that's a restriction if we prohibit the import of goods. The Court of Justice first stated yes, that is a restriction and yes, this restriction can be justified on grounds of public morality as, and we have already seen that statement, I quote, in principle it is for each member state to determine in accordance with its own scale of values and in the form selected by the requirements of public morality in its territory. So basically, the Court of Justice has accepted that uh, that is considered to be obscene, but, uh, and that was uh, a very important uh, element of this case, the problem was that the very same products which were considered to be obscene if imported were not seen as a problem if they were produced or traded in the country itself. And uh, the, the Court of Justice clearly stated that that's a kind of double morality. So it's not morality, but double morality. And therefore, this uh, behavior was not accepted. Again, if those products would not have been produced or traded within the country itself, then uh, that would have been a possibility for the UK to prohibit the import and to rely on this exception of public morality. So if we summarize those findings uh, more broadly, so on EU law and morality, uh, the EU as such does not have a competence to legislate on public morality as such. So there is no EU competence, not an exclusive one, not a shared one. So that's still up uh, to the member states. And the European Court of Justice, when it has to decide on such cases, uh, uses a concept which is called judicial self-restraint. So the court would not impose a solution in a specific field on the member states because again in those member states uh, based on a democratic process the citizens of those countries should be able to decide on those questions especially in sensitive fields. Public morality as we've seen can be a reason of justification so it can justify barriers to the free movement of goods. And as the concept of public morality already uh, um, comprises, it's a public, so it's a collective concept, not an individual. So it, it refers to the morality in the relevant state as such, so it's a collective, not an individual concept. As we have also seen, morality um, has a cultural component, a regional, uh, a temporal component, and it is uh, based on value. Again, it's up to the member states uh, to determine it, uh, but of course they, the limitations which they have to face uh, are double morality, discrimination, or if they apply it in an incoherent way, as in the case we have just seen. So that's the literature mentioned uh, in today's micro lecture, and now you know. The common ground of those various uh, concepts, and there are micro lectures on other concepts, uh, but here uh, in, in this one on morality, the common ground of all those concepts is to provide an answer what's the right thing uh, to do. We've also seen that although sometimes it's used in a uh, maybe a confusing way, but we clearly have to separate ethics, which is a uh, looking through the angle of uh, philosophy 
and we have to separate them from the con from that from the concept of morality, which is part of today's micro lecture. Now, the relationship of EU law and morality, uh, of course, ideally, law should uh, um, adhere to the requirements of morality, um, but as we have seen, that's a concept which changes over uh, time. A concept uh, which in the EU is not defined by the EU, but by the member states. And it's up to the member states uh, to define that concept as, as long as, it, le let's say, as long as it is objective, not discriminatory, uh, not double morality, and not applied in an incoherent way. So now you know more about the, the relationship of law, EU law and morality and see you next time.